Hi, I'm Pastor Tim Leung, and I'd like to thank Pastor Gordon and the elders of the Home of Christ Church for this wonderful opportunity to spend some time with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that these next few minutes would be time well spent and that you would speak to us, comfort us, encourage us, lift us up, challenge us, inspire us, motivate us, and change us in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, they say you really miss something only when it's gone. And in a lot of ways, it's very true. As some of you may know, on April 20th, 2019, I suffered a terrible stroke that left me in the hospital for weeks, paralyzed on my left side, and sent me home in a wheelchair. It began as one of the worst experiences in my life, and what has transpired since then has been singularly the most difficult, challenging, painful, humiliating, frustrating, and terrifying experience we have ever faced as a family. A stroke is a terrible thing. I tell you, I wouldn't wish a stroke upon my worst enemy. Well. One of the things that I learned to miss the most was the use of my left hand. I remember at the rehab center, a staff of doctors would come into my room at the break of dawn and the tallest, gruffiest one would stick two fingers in my hand and he would say, squeeze, try to break my fingers. I would give it all the effort and concentration I could muster, but my hand would barely move. I couldn't even grip the man's fingers. It was the most demoralizing thing for him to then scream at me, try, try harder, he said. No response. Eventually, there was the slightest movement. And believe it or not, that was a major victory. We cried when finally we saw my middle finger and then my ring finger budge just a tiny bit. But of course my left hand had no practical use to me at all. I had been right hand dominant all my life. My right hand was stronger, more coordin coordinated than my left hand. I thanked God over and over again that he spared my right hand. But wow, did I begin to realize how important my left hand was. Many years ago, I went through an exercise phase. You know, we grew up when Arnold Schwarzenegger was the most popular action hero around. He and Jackie Chan were our role models. <laughs> My friends and I used to love to work out to see how big and strong we could get. Can you imagine? For a second, can you imagine trying to bench press without a left hand? <laughs> Can you imagine trying to play golf without a left hand? Oh, one of my favorite things to do to relieve tension and stress was to go out to a driving range and try to hit the 300-yard sign that taunted me at a distance. I was getting pretty good. But one of the most heart-wrenching losses was not being able to sing and play music. You see, I was a music major back in college. That was what I did. I played the piano since a little, since I was a little boy, and it was a huge part of my self-worth and identity. It was how I expressed myself, and that was stripped away from me in one devastating moment. You have to understand, I trained for years and years in college, I spent hours a day in practice to make my left hand play the piano just as artistically and skillfully as my right hand. And now it was utterly useless. It would just hang there, lifeless, flaccid, like some dead piece of meat. Man, I missed my left hand. And I still do for that matter. But you know what? I began to realize I needed my left hand 
for a lot of other things too. Everyday things. I love to cook. I couldn't. It was hard for me to cook anymore. I couldn't flip a frying pan. I couldn't do the most basic practical chores around the house. I couldn't hold a nail. I couldn't climb a ladder. I couldn't even squeeze a tube of toothpaste. That's how weak I was. I couldn't even do the thing that meant most to me. Holding my preschool children in my arms. Holding my wife and giving her a hug. I tell you, it was a devastating loss. But you know, I began to realize something. Left hands are very important to the body. Now let me ask you something. Do you ever feel like a forgotten left hand? You know, kind of take it for granted. A footnote, a support player stuck way deep in right field, out of the way. A bench warmer. Do you ever feel left out because you're not a star player? <clears throat> that even though you work very hard at what you do, other people seem to always get the glory, the attention, the recognition, the reward, but not you. You know, a couple of years ago, I had the amazing opportunity to sit down in a room regularly with some very, very influential ministers. These guys, man, had churches that numbered in the thousands some of them, one guy, the senior, had tens of thousands in his church. They wrote books, won awards. They were nationally known singers and recording artists. They traveled the world doing big, important things. They hobnobbed with movie stars and famous people. And then there was me. Obviously. I was with them, listening to them, enjoying their company, even talking to them. But I wasn't one of them. I never published a book, nor did I win a Dove Award. No radio stations had ever played my songs, and my little churches never came close to numbering in the thousands. In fact, I remember being the youth pastor of a little church whose attendance was so tiny during youth meetings. Sometimes the attendance plunged to a mere four people. Can you believe that? We met in a room, I tell you, that was so dilapidated that during the rainy season, man, they were actually mushrooms growing on the carpet, I kid you not. Can you relate to how I felt? Do you sometimes feel that no matter how hard you try, no matter how long you practice, no matter how many overtime hours you work, no matter what lengths you take, you will never be more than second string part of the course line overlooked, underpaid, underappreciated. For some unknown reason, God himself chooses people next to you, people around you to be wealthy, famous, successful, appreciated, respected. He chooses other people over you, but never you. Maybe there are some times when honestly, you kind of envy someone else. Well, I believe with all my heart that God has got a message, this message, especially for you today. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 12. Paul says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. He wants you to know this. God wants you to know this. What does he want you to know? There are different kinds of gifts, Paul says. But the same Spirit distributes them. 
There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now check this out. To each one, all right, each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit of God is given. Why? For the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith. You see the pattern? Paul establishes this literary pattern. Same Spirit, different individual, different gift. Same Spirit, different individual, different gift. Same Spirit, different individual, different gift. Is he trying to make a point? He concludes this section by saying, all of these are the work of one and the same Spirit of God himself. And God gives them to each one just as he determines. Now, you can get mad at God or you can think about it a moment. You can gain comfort and freedom in this. Like I said, if you've ever suffered from feeling like you were given a raw deal in terms of gifting, talent, or opportunity, listen, God wants you to know something. Here it is. Relax. Relax. God has given you the perfect talents to fit you your temperament, your personality, your circumstances, you as an individual. God has given you exactly the abilities he wants and you need to do his job for you right now. Paul is telling us that there is no need to be envious of another person's gift. You don't need to compare and to contrast, compete to feel inadequate or inferior or even better than someone else. See, that's the problem. When we look at other people, we feel terrible or we feel superior. Either way, it's not beneficial. We either get arrogant or we feel terrible about ourselves. We want to be someone else or want to do something else or we get smug and look down on others. Either way, it's not good at all. Why? Because God has gifted us, you and me, differently. And you know what? He meant to do it that way. It was not by accident. But you see, as Christians, he gave each of us, every one of us, special spiritual gifts just as he determines, the Bible says. Now, we may struggle with this. We may struggle because, well, we see this with American eyes. What do I mean by American eyes? Well, in America, we believe that, right, all men are created equal. Wow, sounds good. That's a wonderful, noble thought. God creates everybody equal. What, is, what do we mean by that? Or what do we think we mean by that? Well, we're equal. We have equal talent, right? Equal gifting, equal opportunity, equal ability. Well, is that correct? No. Think about it. Let me illustrate this point. One day in the fourth grade, my teacher told us about our government system and how we could be a senator or a governor or whatever. She went on and she told us as far as president, however, you had to be a naturally born citizen. But since everyone in her class was born in America, we were naturally citizens and therefore every single one of us could become president of the United States. That's what you tell kids, right? You can grow up to be anything you want, even president. Well, she followed up by asking, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? At that age, even at that age, I wanted to be a wise guy. 
all of a sudden I had a, a lightning bolt of inspiration. And so I raised my hand and I said, I know, I know. Timmy, she said, what would you like to be? I carefully paced my answer for the most dramatic effect. When I grow up, I want to be African American. <laughs> Touche! Of course, I made the class laugh and I got my name on the board. Had to stay after school. But I proved my point. Now, you really can't be anything you want. Now, can you? Obviously, no matter the inspirations of our founding fathers, we are not in reality created equal. Now, I don't want to look as though I'm an American. I love our country. I love what our founding fathers wanted. But I think we need to understand what was it they were trying to say. I think what they meant was that we all have equal worth in God's sight. Our equal rights should be preserved to pursue God and worship Him without government interference. We should be free to pursue happiness in living our lives according to our religious convictions freely without fear of government mandates or state-regulated churches. But man, it would be ridiculous to insist that we are actually objectively created equal. I mean, come on. Think about it. Some people are taller. Some people are shorter. Some people are smarter. Some people have a harder time learning things. We are all born different. It's not just a matter of nurture. A lot of it is nature. It's hardwired. When my son was born, even when he was just a few days old, the doctor already determined, oh, he would probably be so tall. Already, she knew that. Some things we're just born with. For instance, I think I must be the only Asian male in existence that is terrible at math. Some people are healthier. Some people are better looking. Some people are born with more money, more opportunity, more connections, more hair. It would be nice, but no, we are not in reality objectively created equal. But you know what? God has created us with equal value, equal worth in his heart and his eyes. He loves us equally and equally he wants the best for each and every one of us. But we're not the same if that's what you mean by being equal. Paul explains it this way, just as a body though one has many parts but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. The body is not made up of one part, listen, one part, but many. He goes on and he talks about the whole body can't be an eye, can it? That would be ridiculous, one giant eyeball. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. We're still one body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. Paul goes on. God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them. Now check this out. Just as he wanted them to be. Gain comfort from that, my friend. God does nothing by accident. He made you with the gifts and abilities he's given you just as he wanted. Relax. God made you with all the abilities he wanted. And you know, 
that's okay. No, that's more than okay. That's awesome. Even though God never claimed to put everyone on an even playing field, he loves each and every one of his children just as much as he loves Jesus. Furthermore, he has gifted each of us, you and I, for a unique and distinctive place and mission in his body, to bless his body, to benefit his body, all for the common good. Now, we struggle with this because we naturally give prominence and recognition to certain body parts and certain people, for that matter, more than others. That's how we function. That's how we think. For example, let's take the hand. Wow. Now, if you were to look at various body parts, the hand gets a lot of attention, does it? Helping hand, lend a hand, give me a hand. I want to hold your hand. I'm a handyman. <laughs> Hands get an awful lot of press, don't they? If you want to talk about internal organs, how about the heart, right? I give you my heart. I love you with all of my heart. You've broken my heart. You've got my heart wrapped around your little finger. I left my heart in San Francisco. But who wants to be a pancreas? Listen, I was well into my 30s before I even knew what a pancreas was. And it's not until recently did I really realize how important the health of a pancreas is to the rest of the body. Like I told you, I had a terrible stroke. Part of the reason why I had the stroke was aggravated by the inability of my pancreas to produce the insulin I needed to deal with the rising amounts of blood sugar. Now, why did it happen exactly the way it did? I'm not sure. The doctors don't tell me, they don't know. But what we do know for sure is that the pancreas has a crucial part in keeping us healthy. And if something grows wrong or goes wrong with the pancreas, man, you're in big, big trouble. But have you ever heard one starstruck lover exclaim to another, baby, I give you my whole pancreas? No. Tony Bennett would never have become as famous as he did singing, I left my pancreas in San Francisco. But pancreases are needed. And so are gallbladders, livers, kidneys, eyelashes. And if you don't get too much attention because, well, you're sort of hidden, doing your job in the shadows, being faithful so that other people can shine. God is telling you something today. He's telling you, relax. You are exactly the way I made you and I love you. I need you to be faithful in your area of service with the abilities that I made you with. Abilities. Secondly, don't worry about keeping score. In other words, be industrious with the amount of resources that God has given you at this moment. We're talking about A's, okay? A's today. Now, first A is abilities. Second A is amount. Sometimes we look and we think, oh, it's no fair. Someone else has more than I do. Well, as Americans, we like to count, don't we? We like to document records. We like to record stats. We like to keep score. And in a way, that's too bad. Remember the story of the wealthy man in the Bible who left for an extended journey and entrusted his three servants with his wealth. The Bible put it this way. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag. And then he, the Bible says this very interesting phrase. Each according to his ability. Now, we don't like to hear this, right? 
I mean, it's kind of insulting. I mean, according to my ability? That clearly implies that I'm lame. <laughs> if I've been given only one bag of gold, I don't have the ability of the man who has the five. But you know, there's freedom in realizing that it is God who gave the ability in the first place. You see, God knows our ability. And he gives us gifting in accordance with that ability. And you know what? That's a good thing. Because he's not going to demand of us something that he would not give us the ability to accomplish. In other words, he's not going to ask for more than we can do. He knows the ability he gave, gave us and he knows the gifting and he knows the resources he knows the time he knows the circumstances relax here's the secret again let's go to Paul Paul says to Timothy godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And in this area of our lives, we can also cultivate and enjoy the freedom of contentment as we, quote unquote, stay in our own lane. You ever heard of that? Stay in your own lane. Now, oftentimes when you hear that phrase, it's a put down. Stay in your own lane, buddy. Right? Very similar to, oh, you are clearly out of your league. It's meant as a put down. Because in our world system, we have levels. We have strata. We have winners, then super winners, then uber winners, then world famous celebrities, the best in the world. Those who are truly, truly, truly successful. And those who are, well, sort of successful. Locally successful. Kind of successful. But is this how God sees us? Let's take a look. Let's go on with the story. After a long time, the master of those servants returns. And he settles accounts with them. The man who received five bags of gold brought the other five. He invested his five. He made another five. Wow, 100%. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Okay, well, this man is the super uber winner, right? I mean, he was given five and he came back with another five. Wow. Let's take a look at what the master says to what we would consider the B-League dude, all right? The man now with two bags of gold, he only had two. He clearly does not have the ability that the one who, of the one who was giving five. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. Now, notice something. The master doesn't say, ah, oh, pretty good. You did okay for B-League. No. What does he say? <laughs> His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, does that ring a bell? Does that sound familiar? It should. It was exactly word for word the same thing the master said to the one who was originally given five. You see, the master is equally happy with both of them. He is equally full of praise for both of them. He does not devalue the one with two at all. 
compared to the man who was given five. They are both good and faithful. They are both given more. They will both share in their master's happiness. In fact, when you look at it, the only servant that the master condemns is the one who didn't do anything, who didn't even try, who didn't take a risk, who didn't invest what he was given. God gives praise. He is happy. He is pleased. If you and I take a risk and use what he has given us for his kingdom and glory, and the only way we can fail is if we do nothing. Take that bag of gold from him, the master says, and give it to the one who has ten. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. The moral of the story is clear. It is God who gives the ability. It is God who gives the resources. It is God who gives the gift. We don't need to compare ourselves with others. We are free. You are free, brother. You are free, sister, to run your own race with liberty, with joy, and with God-given passion, with enthusiasm, right? Enthusiasm with God in it. The Bible says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In other words, be encouraged. Be confident that God has no problems with you staying in your own lane. In fact, that's what he wants. It is the race marked out for you, and it is that race, and only that race, that Jesus himself is coaching you through. Don't give up, man. Don't look around. Don't worry if others seem to be running faster or if others seem to be running slower. Run your race. Don't grow weary and don't lose heart. Now, this might be a good time to pause and ponder. What might God be telling you right now? Do you find you spend more time looking over your shoulder than enjoying what God has right in front of you? Do you find it hard to stay in your own lane? Are you tired of trying to be someone or something you're not? Tell me, what would it take to shut out the distractions in your life and focus on running the race God has for you? Come to Jesus right now and enter into his rest. Accept his calling upon your life and you can know the freedom and joy of living your life for the audience of one. Now, you can do this right now by saying this simple prayer. Dear God, I admit that sometimes I try to be something that I'm not. I get stressed out taking on a lot more than I'm called to do. I come to you now and want to enter into your rest. I accept your calling upon my life to serve you with all the gifting, talent, and resources you have given me. Help me to cut out distractions and hindrances. Help me to team up with other Christians around me and look to follow your lead by reading your word every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that prayer, congratulations, I'm happy for you. And I look forward to what God is going to do in your life. I look forward to seeing you 
next time.